If you want this podcast free of ads, follow us now on patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams. What in the world is happening on Wall Street? Economic indicators. Who knows where this is going to end up? To understand the economy, you have to understand human nature. This podcast is powered by ACAST. How are you doing there? It's podcast time, but again, it is August, so we're doing different podcasts and different ideas, and here we have a fantastically interesting conversation with you. Again, we're going back to some of the classics that were recorded late June at the Dorky Book Festival, so a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks back. This is a fascinating discussion between Edge of U2, guitar player, but secret science lover, and Brian Cox, scientist, but secret musician. Brian Cox, who you know, the UK is probably preeminent scientist, man who has made science popular, who has endlessly fascinating documentaries on science, on the cosmos, on the meaning of life. And Edge of You Too, who is a deep, deep thinker, as well as an extraordinary musician. And what's really fascinating about this conversation, I think you're going to love it, is the way in which both of these guys come alive to each other's worlds. And both of these guys are talking about the meaning of life. We're talking, are we here on our own? We're talking about environment. We're talking about our custody as humans of this planet. And Brian is going off on one about spirituality. It's really fascinating stuff. And I think you're going to really enjoy it. So here we have U2's Edge and Brian Cox on quantum physics and music. Enjoy. Now we have something really very special. About a year ago, no, actually it wasn't a year ago because it was before the pandemic, I found myself in the Royal Society in London, the Holy of Holies of British science. And I was in the company of two individuals who I would never have put together. And in the Royal Society, there's a library. And in the library, there's a ledger. Now we're talking about Boyle, we're talking about Newton, we're talking about the greats of British science. And this big ledger is like the tabernacle of the Royal Society. And as we went through it, and as the museum guide was going through it, two individuals were particularly fascinating. I'd never seen these two individuals, you know, looking over this as if they were looking at some sort of rare manuscript, which it was. And one was Edge from U2, and the other was Professor Brian Cox. Now I said to myself, Jesus, how did I put these two together? And then it transpires that Brian was a musician who ended up being a scientist. And Edge, I think it's fair to say, is a musician who could easily have been in a different uh, world of scientists. So when I asked the pair of them, would you come and have a chat? Edge emailed me back and said, yes, David, we're going to talk about music, creativity, and quantum physics. So <laughs> I decided I'm out of this conversation completely. So Brian Cox, <laughs> Edge, great to have you both. Edge, take it away. <laughs> well, thank you, David. And what a great pleasure it is to welcome Professor Brian Cox to the Dorky Book Fair. And um, I've spent many years living in the area and watched this wonderful local event become this big global thing. So it's a real pleasure um, to have you on, on, on this. And so we'll kick it off. Yeah, I mean, I think Dave is right. There, there's, uh, we, we actually have so many common interests. And, um, you know, I, I ended up doing music professionally, but I've always been fascinated by science, still am. And you sort of went almost professionally into music, uh, but then did a kind of sharp right turn and ended up um, going, going into to physics and quantum physics and particle physics. So tell us about your, your brush with music. Like what was, the, what was that early phase of, of life and, and how close did you actually get to doing music full time? Well, my, my brush with music is intertwined with Ireland, actually, in a very profound way, because the first band that I joined when I was 18 was founded by Darren Wharton, who was a keyboard player from Thin Lizzy. So he played oh, right. on, um, I think, albums, uh, certainly Black Rose, Thunder and right. Lightning, 
those albums. So the late, the later you of Lizzie's albums, because he was he was young. I mean, he was the baby of the band. Um, right. And then, so I, that was a band called Den, and we got a. I joined it when I was eighteen, accidentally, because I'd made, as we all do. I'm going to ask you in a minute how you what was your first demo tape, because I really want to know what your first demo tape was. But we we made a demo tape when I was, I don't know, fourteen or fifteen or something. Um, and Darren inexplicably, I'll never know why he did it, but he moved uh, to Oldham in in, okay. in Manchester, which is where I'm from. And my dad met him in the pub, and it, so he was the local. Like rock god, right? the guy from Britain right. is in a pub in Oldham. Um, and so my dad gave him, without me knowing, gave him this tape, demo tape, which was just me, 14 or 15. And then when Lizzie split up, he formed this band called Dare and needed a keyboard player. And remember, there was a guy up the road who, uh, actually, you know, he's always said to me that I looked the part. He had no idea how well I could play keyboards. <laughs> and it wasn't very good because I was self-taught. I didn't really know what I was doing. But but I could program <laughs> the synths, right? Right. He wasn't very good at that. So so um so I joined that band. We got a deal with AM Records. Wow. We recorded an album in Los Angeles. We, we, in I'd Los Angeles. Been, I'd never been out of the country. And then um, oh the God. AM said, Oh well, you're going to LA. And so we made it with uh, Larry Klein, who right. was married to Joni Mitchell at the time, great bass player. And Mike oh. Shipley, who produced a load of uh, the Def Leppard albums, I think. I think he'd been the engineer on Night at the Opera, actually. So right, right. Great heritage. And then we, so we made the album. We toured. My first professional gig was with Jimmy Page, supporting Jimmy Page. Um, what? And then, and then Gary Moore. You're kidding. That's yeah, so Jimmy wow. Page, Gary Moore. And then we did a huge tour with Europe, which was kind of an incredibility. A step. <laughs> they were a great live band, though. They were great fun. Yeah. The final countdown. Uh, made another album. It all went a bit wrong. Uh, we had a fight in a bar in Berlin when we were on tour. <laughs> I came back to the UK and thought, sod this, and uh, applied to the University of Manchester right. to do physics. But it was kind of October, November, and I had to wait a year, so I needed a job. So I got a job driving this band uh, who didn't have a deal at the time up and down the country, my Rover car. I had this rusty Rover thing. We I mean, used to drive up these little gigs. And that was Dereen. So that was Peter. Right. Um, he was, so he was he from Derry. And he's, yeah. he's a Derry boy. He was actually yeah. signed. His first band was called Tie the Boy, and they were signed to Mother Records. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we have oh, Link funny. going back all that time. Yeah. And then, of course, Dereen got a deal, and I ended up at university at the same time. As playing right. the keyboards with D Ream, and then D Ream had the hits, you know, things gonna get better and all that. Yeah. Stuff. So that was my good career <laughs> in music. So it was quite a long career in bits, about five years with Dare, and then and then while I was at university with D Ream. Well, what was your first demo tape? That's what I wow. wanted. Wow. Well, I mean, like you, our early demos were nothing to get excited about. And um we befriended a local guy who um had been in bands for many years and he told us that if we could get a free house for an afternoon or a, or a day he would be able to rent a mixing desk and a few microphones and we could set up in the living room and we could actually do a demo so we waited until and it turned out my parents went away first so we uh, we didn't tell them what was happening but um virtually as soon as the car turned the bend at the, at the bottom of the road, there was a, a bunch of lads showed up with uh, equipment and we brought the drums into the living room, um, the guitar amps and wired the whole place up um, and spent the afternoon making a truly atrocious demo tape, <laughs> which, which was our very first kind of attempt at songwriting. But um you know, I remember it so vividly, and the magic of hearing hearing back, even though it was really bad, it was it was kind of such a trophy to have this tape. Yeah, I've still got it. It's, I've got it on a, really? a, a, a you know a big reel, right? It was yeah. a, I think we mastered it on a B seventy seven or something. But we recorded it. Eventually, we recorded it in an eight track studio in Oldham that a friend right. of mine had on a big. I think it was a two inch eight track. It's ridiculous. <laughs> I'm being so, big now that stuff. But, so hold on a second, right? Was this a full band? I mean, this demo that you're talking about was were you like the keyboard player in your own band before Dare? Yes, yeah, so it was. It was you know it was a school band, and it was right. um, mainly don't knock band. school bands. I'm just saying school oh. bands can sometimes work out really well. Uh, well, yeah, cause, yeah. 
<laughs> my, but that's what it was. So, well, that's, that's how most people started. Right? Yeah, of course. Most people still start. Um, so I've got this demo. So what I need now is, is a Reebok B77 so I can listen to it again. All right. Well, we, I put the word out. Yeah. So uh, my story is, is that I um, did mostly sciences in high school. And then we got into this high school band. And uh, the, the last year that I was in high school, um, the two guys who are the older two in the band, Bono and Adam, both ended up, for different reasons, repeating. So they ended up um, repeating their final year. So that, that was the year where you two really started becoming much more expert and much more serious. And we started writing our own songs and we actually became quite a tight little unit. And then at the end of that year, I could, I could see college looming. And so I preempted this issue. I went to my parents and said, look, um, I want to see if we can get a record deal. I want to uh, try and, and give this band a go. So can I do a year out? Mm. And they, I think they were impressed by the fact that I'd taken the initiative. So they said, okay, you take a year out and, you know, you can do a bit of work around and we'll, you know, we'll give you five or a week pocket money just to keep you, uh, you know, in bus fares, et cetera, and see what you can do with the band. So the end of that year came around in, in the September and at that point, we'd actually managed to get a, um, a single out. and Things were starting to really happen, but there was no record deal. So I felt compelled to honor my side of the bargain. So I actually went to college to um, a place called Kevin Street, and I studied science. I studied natural science, which is chemistry, and um, did that for from September through to December. And then we went on this tour of London during the break. We, uh, we didn't get a record deal even then, but when we came, came back, we did one final show, the homecoming show, and um, a representative from Island Records came along, saw us play in front of a very impressive crowd and offered us a record deal. So my third level college career lasted from September to Mid January, <laughs> and that was it, and I was gone. And the next time I went to, to Kevin Street was playing with you too, which would have been probably another year or so later. And some of the guys that I was in school with, I still meet them occasionally. One of them, believe it or not, is the master brewer at Guinnesses, and um, and another guy is running a chemical plant in Holland. But um, they remember that so well. It was like that was the guy. He was in our school. He was. They remember me from class. It was really a, a, a cute moment. So, so basically, both you and I kind of, if things had gone a little bit differently, we could have been in very different and probably almost the same trajectory, but reversed. So, yeah. Um, but you you did go into physics, and you you. But originally, you were interested in astronomy. You were interested in kind of the big stuff, the planets, the solar system, the universe but now then you've gone the other way you're now into particle physics physics and quantum theory and you're you have that great gig at cern which is the particle accelerator at the european one mm. so, so yeah. tell us about that journey they, i mean they, they are related and, and you're right i started doing astrophysics so now actually uh, i've come full circle and i'm interested in black holes which um if you give me any time I shouldn't talk about because I never stop and I talk about black holes. <laughs> they're fascinating. They're the real frontier of our knowledge. But they, these yeah. things are are related. They're, they're both. Um, that we're asking fundamental questions um, in particle physics. We're asking what what are the fundamental building blocks of the universe and what are the forces that stick them together. Um, in cosmology, we're, we're asking about the large scale structure of the universe which involves trying to understand how these particles came into being in the first place. And now actually with black holes, where those two disciplines have merged together and um, really um, initiated by people like Stephen Hawking about sort of in the 70s, 80s, black holes force us to think about both the quantum, so the, 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 the smallest objects and how you know, energy and fields behave in the universe, and general relativity, which is Einstein's theory of gravity, which dates from 1915. So it's remarkable, actually, that our best theory of the universe and our best theory of gravity in the universe on the largest scales, scales, you know, 
far bigger than distances between the galaxies even, comes from somebody's mind in 1915 before we knew there were galaxies beyond the Milky Way. It's quite wow. powerful, actually. The science of cosmology, which is the study of the evolution of the universe, predates our discovery that there was a universe beyond our own island of stars. And it perhaps goes back, actually, to what you're saying about both of us are interested in both the arts, music, and science. I think because they're both creative endeavors. And, and nobody demonstrates that better, I think, than Einstein. And I know it's a cliche often. I'm not, I'm not trying to get involved in a, with, with historians in the great man theory of history. You know, so I'm not trying to do that. But Einstein is interesting because many people to this day, you will read physicists who write about Einstein, who say that it's perhaps unlikely that anybody else would have discovered his theory of general relativity. Even today, it was, a, it was an immensely creative act. It was a leap mm. to the dark. And the last thing I'll say actually about it, which is interesting, is I remember, uh, in fact, I was talking in, in a college yesterday, or the day before up in Middlesbrough, and I said to the students, um, because some, someone said, you know, I'm, I'm, I love physics, but I'm not so good at maths. And I remembered a story where Einstein had given a talk in a school and somebody said to him, how can I contribute? You know, you're this great genius. I'll never be that. And he said, when I was your age, I was no Einstein. <laughs> and it took Einstein. It took Einstein from, from the creative act. Um, yeah. We, we was realizing this idea of gravity as geometry, this beautiful yeah. idea. Um, it, he, he made that leap in 1908. And it took him seven years to do the mathematics, basically, even wow. though that mathematics was available. So he didn't really invent the mathematics. It was quite obscure, but it was there. So, you know, even I understand, you know, it's interesting that there's a creative moment, which he described as the happiest thought of his life, when he came up with this idea, this, you know, brainwave, that uh, the right. foundation of general relativity. And it took him seven years to build the theory. So it's, it's interesting. He also, there's a great quote, my favorite quote from Einstein is that imagination is more important than knowledge. And what blew my mind about him was I, I kind of assumed, I suppose, I suppose most people do, that he was looking at math and looking at the work of previous theorists from a sort of formal point of view and then discovered this new concept. But in fact, he didn't. He imagined it. He had the vision and the power of imagination to, to kind of, to just have that vision of what relativity was and, and, and how gravity exists as a disturbance in space time. And then he went about proving it mathematically and came up with that incredible uh, formula e equals mc squared. So it proves, I think, t to your point that, you know, science and music is incredibly similar in that it does involve leaps of, of perception and understanding that actually don't really make sense. They're not, it's not incremental. You can get this massive jump. And, I, you know, when we're working on songs occasionally, that will happen where we'll suddenly have this, the song will arrive and everyone in the room sort of recognizes that something, something unique is happening. And so the song one happened incredibly quickly. You know, just I had a few chord sequences, put them together, and suddenly within 10 minutes we're in the room playing together and the song arrives. So I, I do get how, you know, it is something that we are uniquely able to do. And the other thing that we've spoken about before is this other thing of once you have the knowledge is, is to find the meaning behind it. And I love, Brian, your you approach some of the big questions of meaning from a very scientific point of view, and yet they, they don't seem to contradict the meaning that people get to when they're coming from a completely different starting point of, of sort of spirituality and, and philosophy and those ideas. So I'd love you to talk about your view of you know, life on earth, humanity, and, and kind of our place in the universe, because I think it's very interesting. Yeah, I think, I think what's interesting about um, cosmology is it forces us to confront the biggest questions. Um, in this case, yeah, we know 
that the universe, the observable part of the universe, the bit that we can see, contains something like two trillion galaxies, um, each with, let's say, 200 billion, perhaps anything up to a trillion stars. So we have a universe that's unimaginably vast, even the bit we can see. And we think it extends beyond that. We're pretty sure it does. And it, and it may well be infinite. So from just a brutal <laughs> sort of perspective of those numbers, uh, we appear in significance. Right? That's number one. Totally. And you can't claim anything else on that base level. But um, it is also the case that uh, although we don't know um, how common life is in the universe, um, what we do know is we haven't detected any beyond the Earth, even microbes. And we certainly haven't detected any other civilizations. And actually, one of the great joys of making television programs is I get to wander outside of my field of immediate expertise, right? So I do astronomy and particle physics, but I can talk to biologists. And when I talk to many biologists and friends of mine at the University of Manchester, for example, they, almost all of them that I talk to, think that whilst microbes may be very common throughout the universe, we may even find them subsurface on Mars, right? So there may have been a second or third genesis in our solar system. But the transition from microbes to civilization and to intelligence and to complex life looks unlikely. Um, the, mm. the piece of evidence for that is that it took something like three billion years on the Earth. So life began three and a half billion years ago on the Earth, pretty much as soon as it could, after the Earth had formed and cooled down. But you see no complex life at all until around five or 600 million years ago. So you're talking, if that's uh, even remotely um, usual, you know, that timeline's not strange for some reason, then you're saying that you need a quarter of the age of the universe or more to go from a microbe to something that can think. And, and there, if you're asking for worlds, planets and stars that stay stable enough for long enough for that to happen, then it may be very few indeed. I mean, if you, yeah. And so essentially you can make an argument. I emphasize that we don't know, nobody knows, but you can make an argument that there may be on average one or two civilizations per galaxy at any one time. Now, now what is that, to, to your question of meaning, I would argue that meaning is a property of brains. Right? It's a property of conscious organisms. I, I, so I think meaning exists because the universe means something to us, self-evidently. It resides within us. Um, that's my mm -hmm. view. And so if you take that view, if you think meaning, whatever it is, is a property of consciousness, which is a physical property of the universe, but it exists in very few places across the universe, Maybe it only on this planet, possibly, in a galaxy, in an island of 200 billion stars, this is the only island of meaning. Then suddenly, from that perspective, we are immensely valuable, mm. notwithstanding our physical insignificance. Now, what I've said there, I've said some things that are science, right? That we know how many galaxies there are and how many stars there are in a galaxy, how long it took for life to emerge and evolve on this planet. We know all those things. What we don't know is how common life is, and we don't know what to make of it. Uh, so yeah. I've given you an opinion, and that's where I, that's why I strongly believe that, that if we're going to ask what is the meaning of it all, yeah. then you need that, that. I've taken a philosophical view, perhaps partly theological, certainly artistic, and I've merged those things together to come to my own view. So it's a proposition. I think right. we are rare and un immeasurably valuable. And I also think it would be good if more people knew that, because I think mm. the way we run this world is, that's what we were talking about when we first met, actually. I met David as well. We were talking about how we run this planet. And I think it's relevant, right? I yeah. think that thought, that one thought, it may be that this is the only island of meaning in a galaxy of 200 billion stars might be useful to yeah. us politically, right? That's, as well as emotionally. I know, and it's. I, I always wonder when when you hear about uh, people like Elon Musk talking about colonizing Mars, and you start to think, well, maybe his instinct is that uh, he needs to get out because clearly we can't seem to generate the political will to 
to kind of deal with our our major existential threats, uh, certainly the threats to the environment. So he wants to to sort of up and leave. Actually, I did get a chance to ask him the question, and uh, it wasn't the answer I was expecting. He said, "Well, think about it as." life and human life being so rare and so sacred and it happens to be all of our eggs in this one basket called planet earth you know how how kind of smart is it to risk it all on this one planet shouldn't we attempt to spread our risk by going to to mars and i from that perspective i started to understand that there was some validity to it i mean because we've had massive comet strikes in the past that wiped out pretty much every everything on Earth. So it's not unprecedented to have something like that occur. To your point of, of the uniqueness of life and hum, human life in particular, I think it's always interesting talking to astronauts, as I have on a couple of occasions had the chance. And they say that that moment where they actually get to look back at, at Earth or, or view it kind of out the window. They sort of see this beautiful but vulnerable blue disc, this blue sphere floating in this inky black nothingness. It sort of brings home this fact that this is such an incredibly precious and unique place. And our, our part of that is, as you say, both incredibly rare and important, but also in the, in the big scope of things. You know, we, we do have to also be very humble about it and realize that, you know, in time and space, we're, we're so insignificant, we're so tiny. And, and trying to balance those two, what seem to be contradictions, and come up with the right um, formula for, for dealing responsibly with this planet. I think that's one of the big challenges that we now face. I, I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head something really interesting, which is I think that the, the answer to these complex questions lies in that twilight zone between ideas that seem mutually, well, I was going to say in physics, as we call them orthogonal, right, at right angles, ideas right. that do not fit together, yeah. obviously. But, but in that, that, that zone between them, I think, is, is, is the answer. I mean, nobody has the answer, but yeah. it, it, it's trying to understand what it means to be physically insignificant, as you said, which, which re- requires humility. Right. We are not at the center of the universe. That's a tremendously important fact. Mm. And I think historically it's seen that the, the, the struggle we've had to demote ourselves from the center of the universe is, is partly the, the story of civilization, isn't it? So, so humility is important. But at the same time, that you can become nihilistic if you're not careful. Mm. You just say, well, it doesn't matter, does it? Because we're just a speck of dust. But actually, I think we do matter because I think meaning matters in the universe. I I think without life, which I think is something that emerges as a consequence of the laws of physics, the laws of nature, then there's no meaning. The the universe is meaningless. Now, I mean, just to to, to take an extreme position, which I'm sure is not correct, but let's imagine that this is the only world where consciousness has arisen. Just imagine that. That would mean that if we eliminated ourselves through a, a de- deliberate act, nuclear war or something, or, or just by ignoring the threat, you know, ignoring the fact that nature is dangerous and not doing all we can to survive, we would be responsible for eliminating meaning in the universe. Right? Now, wow. I don't think that it's likely that we're the only civilization in the universe because there are so many galaxies and it happened here so it can happen elsewhere. But it could be that civilizations are just rare islands of meaning, as I said. So we could, we could, by our own inaction or by our deliberate acts, eliminate meaning in a galaxy. That mm. is a possibility. That's interesting, I think. What, what a perspective to have. I know. I, it's, it's a, I think it's, it's sobering in a great way. But I also think, um, as you know, I think that we have got to a sort of despondent place in terms of of taking on these big challenges. And it seems like a lot of times people just zone out because they don't believe that politics is is functioning to give us the right results that that are essential. But I I think what we're going to be seeing over the next number of years is uh, the trends towards transparency continue. And I think... I can start to see a shift, a subtle shift 
away from what you might call an age of exploitation, both political exploitation, but also exploitation of nature into an age of cooperation, partnership. Because as transparency becomes more and more prevalent, exploitation will just naturally be eliminated. And particularly when it comes to nature, you know, we, we now have so much science that's telling us that you know, we, we have blasted through our planetary boundaries on so many fronts and it isn't sustainable. It will actually eventually start to erode our ability to live on planet Earth. So I'm hopeful that that sort of news and, and, and more of that kind of stuff will, will start to inform people on a, on a sort of democratic you know, level where, where they, will, they will sort of vote their conscience and will we'll start to insist that politicians address these issues. So I know a lot of people are kind of down on things at the moment. I have to say, I think if you really looked at the, the wider sweep of history, things have been getting better and better. And I, I really do believe that if we, if we don't lose uh, our optimism and, and a kind of proactive instinct to get engaged and we do follow through on our conscience. I think things are going to actually go well. We, we just have to be diligent, but I do, I am very hopeful. You're, you're right that things change. We almost forget that things were worse in some ways in the past. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's obviously, if you go far back in the past before antibiotics, for example, things were worse. But um, it's interesting, we, we talk about politics and the way that people behave at the moment. And then um, I got really interested in Robert Oppenheimer for many reasons. And Oppenheimer, well, no, is, is a, a, an interesting figure. He, he, he was a, one of the great black hole theorists, actually. So before the Second World War, he, he, he wrote some of the seminal early papers on black holes. But then he went into the Manhattan Project, as many of the great physicists in the US did, was the leader of that scientifically and felt, I think, responsible in some way for the death and destruction that was visited on, on Japan. And it was interesting that you see in his writing in the 50s that he was surprised to be alive because he thought that the power that he and his colleagues had delivered to civilization and to politicians, that we did not have the wisdom to control that power. So he felt that the knowledge, you know, he very famously quoted the, um, the Hindu scriptures, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds, right? Mm-hmm. In other words, there is such a thing as too much knowledge for a fragile human being without the wisdom to deploy it and control it. Now, but he wrote, so he spent a lot of the time in the 50s writing. He gave the BBC Reef Lectures, which I recommend to anyone who's listening. You can get them. The transcripts are online at the BBC, I think. I think it was 1953. And what he was doing was using all that, expert, that experience and the, the, the horror, I think, internally that he felt to think about how science and thinking scientifically can benefit us politically and socially. Right. And, and one of the key points that he made, which is what we've been talking about, is the ability, in, in simple terms, it's the ability to hold multiple ideas in your heads, in your head, right? It's, it's important. Yeah. But going back to that idea of the, the, the strain, the challenge of cosmology, which is we're physically insignificant and yet potentially valuable, he wrote about, he would say, well, let's think, in, in what, what's politics? You're balancing, for example, the rights of the individual, which would be at an extreme end, a, a libertarian, I suppose, with the needs of society. And again, in, in, in his terms, he was pursued by McCarthy and all sorts of things. So, so he'd say communism from the 50s. So we, but you know what I mean? That there's, there's, yeah. there's the needs of society against the needs of the individual. And he said that, his point was that you can't have a complete picture of a society, of a human society, without understanding that all these perspectives are valid. What, what we do as individuals is we weight them, but they're mm-hmm. all there. It's like quantum mechanics. It's like saying a particle can be everywhere in the room or the box in which it's contained. That nature forces you to accept that is true. Right? You cannot have a complete picture of a particle like an electron without accepting that it can be a bit wavy and an extended thing, and sometimes it's a point light thing. And you have to have all perspectives in order to understand it and appreciate it. And he, I think, it is, I think he was a genius, Oppenheimer, because he took that and said, that's what nature teaches us about politics. Because people are not, your adversary is not absolutely wrong. 
And you are not absolutely right. What you've done is taken all these difficult ideas that come with having a function in society and being a human being, and you've just weighted them a little bit differently. But all these perspectives are not only valid, but necessary. And I thought that was a wonderful insight. And what he's saying, of course, is that nature is a great teacher because nature forces you to think in these quite uncomfortable and difficult ways because, because you can't think any other way because nature is what nature is. So I can't dodge the fact I have to think of an electron like a wavy thing and a point light thing and all over the place. I can't dodge it. You can dodge it in a society, but you were wrong. You've, you've not got a complete picture anymore. Right. There's something that in, happened recently with uh, climate science where the climate scientists were trying so desperately to avoid overstressing and making claims that they couldn't stand over. So they, they ended inadvertently, they ended up kind of underplaying some of the things that initially became evident about climate change. Now we've sort of caught up. We've realized actually they were being quite conservative and we're starting to see that some of the, the tipping points are actually far closer than we, we imagined. But the other thing that we talked about the other day that I thought was great was a wonderful quality of science is this, they're comfortable. Scientists have to be comfortable with accepting they were wrong. It's an important part of the process of the scientific method. You theorize, then you test your theory. And I mean, recently, some, some major scientists in, in the area of, of dark matter and dark energy had to admit that now that they've actually been able to, to do scans of the dark matter that's in the universe, they, their entire life's work has been proved wrong. Their theories that they've been trying to prove for 30, 40 years, they now go, well, that was a lot of rubbish. And, and, that, and be okay about that. Be saying, yeah. And I think we need more of that in, in other areas of life, yeah, politics well, particularly. And more than okay. But of course, well, if you're interested in learning about nature rather than being right, right then um, when, when you get something wrong, you've learned some more. So you've narrowed it down. And so you, you'll be delighted. You won't only accept it, you'll be delighted because you've got closer to understanding nature by having your own theory ruled out. <laughs> right. So, yeah. and, and again, one of the other um, Manhattan Project scientists, Richard Feynman, at the same time as Oppenheimer in the 50s, wrote very similarly about these ideas. And he said, as you said, he felt that the greatest gift that science gives us as one of the disciplines that are necessary as a human being to, to think about is the experience of being wrong. And it's, it's a beautiful thing. And he went on to say, that that's what democracy is. Uh, so mm. democracy is the acceptance that you don't know how to run a country <laughs> because you change it. And you, the, the most valuable thing you do in a democracy is have elections and change every four or five years. You know, and sometimes someone gets in for a bit longer, but ultimately the cycles come and go when we change. That's the implicit acceptance that we don't know how to run society. And it's mm. a challenge for me actually recently because... You know, recently, um, politics has not gone in the way that I would like. But what I've come to understand is that that's a signal that I live in a free society. (laughs) Because if it always went the way I wanted it to, then what am I doing? I'm living in a dictatorship, presumably, where I'm the dictator if I get in my way all the time. So I I go back to Feynman. When I'm disappointed about the outcome of an election or whatever it is, then I go back to Feynman and think, but it's the signal that our society is functioning, that I didn't get my way. Mm. And, and I think, it, you know, recently, of course, you know, we've had people um, 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 with my outlook on the world, they've had quite a kicking in, in bo- on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, but, uh, you know, as the cycles will come and go, and, and I think it's important to accept, to celebrate, actually, sometimes, but hard as it is, to celebrate it when things go against you because it's yeah. you're not in a dictatorship. And, and maybe, David, you could comment on that idea of, of, of scientists having to always admit that they're wrong because in economics, it's like even <laughs> probably even worse. No one oh, can predict God. what's going on. I mean, you know, this has been, guys, this has been absolutely fascinating, but uh, it's interesting you're mentioning Feynman. I think he was the man who said, I'd prefer to have 
questions with no answers than answers without any questions. And meaning this idea that you're constantly trying to reassess things. And one of the problems with economics is that economics prescribes. And as you know, science tries not to prescribe. So most scientific methods and most scientific discoveries come from kind of messiness. Like people say, ooh, what's going on here? I didn't really figure this out. This is interesting to me. And I think that uh, if we could take your conversations, I mean, what I found really fascinating there is this idea that we may well be unique. And if we are unique, the stakes are incredibly high. It's a sort of a philosophical thing to deal with. They're incredibly high. And therefore, our actions are not not only consequential for us, but they're consequential for these big ideas as Brian was saying, of meaning and, and, and logic and, and, and philosophy and who we are. I mean, when we last sat down, the three of us, the book that you eventually gave me, Edge, The Good Ancestor, was mm-hmm. about to be published. And I think we've, the three of us have read this by, by Roman Trisanich. And he starts with this extraordinary little, little gem of a paragraph about the 1950s. And he's talking about Jonas Salk. And this is obviously quite a topical given we're all into inoculations and vaccinations. And Jonas Salk was working on the vaccination for polio for, I think, nine years. Uh, And as Brian was saying, like relentlessly, kind of like Einstein, you know, this idea, but it took a long, long time for him to actually get this product from his imagination through the testing periods out onto the market. And people were really, really shocked in the 1950s how Jonas Salk, once he came up with this vaccination for polio, which is an awful disease, awful, awful disease, he gave it away. He didn't patent it. And Mm. when when he was asked, how come you gave this away, Dr. Salk, when you could have become immensely wealthy on the back of this or some pharmaceutical company? He said, our job is to be a good ancestor. And our job is to leave this planet, because we're only here for a while, we're only custodians Mm. for a lifetime, to try and leave this place in a better condition than when we got it. Uh, And when I've listened to both of you talking and discussing, and I I, I quite like the demo tapes, actually. I like the start of the demo, okay? I I particularly like the fact that Brian's Alphala met a guy in a pub and gave the demo tape. And the fact that it took your parents to go off before you two could actually get in to the first studio (laughs) and get making. But it's, it's, it's that idea, it's that idea that we need to try and figure out politically, economically, whatever, how to be good ancestors. And that's our, that's yeah. our job. That's our job. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's, it's really about a, an exercise in long-term thinking because what's happened to society over the, the last number of centuries is that our, our vision for the future is getting shorter and shorter. And we see it expressed in so many ways, and particularly in, in political cycles. You know, no politician is going to create something that that creates a short-term deficit that's going to benefit generations to come because of course they're relying on on looking good in the short term Absolutely. to get reelected so it's it's really that's really the flaw of of democracy and i think the the sort of the we've got to bridge that gap as as citizens and as voters we've just got to become much more engaged with the sort of long-term projects that are the things that will ultimately impact on the environment and will, you know, save us, I think, from from the destructive uh, patterns that have existed. There's this whole thing now that people discuss in in the environmental circles called externalities. And externalities is a kind of euphemism for destruction that you can get away with and not have to deal with. And sort of plastic pollution of the oceans is is a perfect example. I found out recently that... uh, in the 1960s, the, the first companies who were in the plastics business to, to kind of promote single-use plastic, um, they were a little alarmed when the incidence of littering immediately exploded and people are throwing empty plastic bottles and empty wrappers uh, around the countryside in America. So they got together and they started the first anti-littering TV campaign which is, if you grew up in America, um, I've I've talked to a lot of Americans of my vintage, and they say that they remember so clearly this ad of this guy who was maybe uh, Native American or 
pretending to be crying because of litter. And, you know, at the time it really made an impact and sure enough, littering the countryside went down. But it was actually to prevent single-use plastic being outlawed, which now we're seeing, you know, whatever it is, 30 years later, 40 years later, that we're going to have to rethink this. So it uh, it just indicates to me that, uh, you know, we as individuals have a huge part to play in all of this and being aware and being positive and hopeful and engaged is, is going to be more and more important as time goes on. No, no, absolutely. And I mean, and Brian, in your own way, I mean, you have made science so accessible, the message so comprehensible to many, many millions of people, myself included, who prior to, to you coming on telly, Brian, never really watched a science program. So it's doable. It's a communication issue. Would you not think? Yes, I think that um, I think what I try to do, and I really learned this from from people that went before. In particular, I'm thinking of Carl Sagan. He didn't try to isolate science from the rest of society, uh, and mm. for, he didn't try to isolate it from the arts and from politics. He was explicit in his documentaries that this is one of the foundations of our civilization. It is one of the important ways that we meet this challenge of the meaning of it all, right? And, and how are we going to live our lives? And so I think that the way to make science accessible is to put it in a wider context. So it's mm. obviously, it's interesting. And, and the thing is, it's difficult sometimes because we talk, you know, we haven't really talked about black holes. I know we've run out of time, but they're the most esoteric things you can think about. You, you think, well, what, what have they got to do with anything? You know, it's a, a collapsed star, strange thing, nothing can escape from a black hole, what's that got to do with anything at all? But they are part of nature. And what we've learned again and again is that if you want to understand nature, of which we are, I will say, the most remarkable part, right? Which is sometimes a... I I mean that because I think that, that our civilization and our knowledge, you know, humans are... The, as, as I said, the, 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 the means by which meaning appears in this local part of the universe, right? So we want to understand nature. When we understand nature, it teaches about ourselves because we're a part of it. And mm-hmm. one of the most remarkable things about black holes is that they're challenging us to ask a question, which I think means a lot to all of us, which is what is time? Mm. But now time is the most human of experiences is the thing, you know, we get old and we have memories and regrets and joy and fears and hopes for the future. Time is just fundamental to the human experience. And we don't know what it is, right? In Einstein's theory, it's just there is such a thing as a clock which comes in there. But with black holes, uh, we're beginning to think that there are building blocks of time. So like atoms of time. We don't know what they are. But black holes are strongly suggesting to us that there is such a thing. So we're beginning to think that maybe space and time themselves are built out of something else, which are neither space nor time. It goes with, to, to you, David, it goes, um, it, often the analogy used is a, as, uh, with an economy. So you say, where, where's the economy? Where is the economy mm. located? The economy of Dublin, where is it? You know, it's, it's kind of, it, it emerges, right? It emerges from some deeper action. The actions mm-hmm. of people and businesses and so on. It's not a thing that you can point to and say, there it is. But it's literally. You're but, absolutely right. And, and lots of it, Brian, is in our mind. Yeah. You know, it's in our mind. It's a concept that we've decided to absorb, but we've never really felt it or imagined it, but we've conceived it and we yeah. create it and we make it bigger in our own heads and yeah. sometimes make it smaller in our own heads. I was listening to both of you, Brian and Edge, and unfortunately we are out of time, but Edge mentioned the externalities, which struck me as only a word that economists could come up with, or it would be the name of a new wave four (laughs) piece or five piece from the early 80s, the externalities, sounds quite good. Yeah, Yeah. I have their first single. (laughs) Exactly, and I was thinking, you know what you should do, both of you, or could do, right? You know, Edge is somebody who really invented an entirely new way of playing guitar that people flocked to because it made some difference in our heads and that way the music just resonates. And Brian, somebody who took science and made it democratic and popular 
and said it can be wrong. You know, we go back to the demo and the music, you know, I'm just thinking here with my producer hat on, you know, maybe there's a five piece band that could go on the road. <laughs> Yeah, with uh, Brian yeah. rediscovering his uh, his keyboard, you know, Edge persuading Bono and Larry and, you know, and Adam to take on a keyboard player and go on the road <laughs> and communicate the message. Do you fancy it? <laughs> the externalities. The externalities. The externalities. I can see it. I can see it. Well, I'm sorry that we didn't get a chance to really go into new discoveries in the, the area of black holes, but it is... Um, as you say, it's constantly evolving. And that's what's great about science. It's like Newton was superseded by Einstein. And now there's, there's all these new theories that try to correct or, or explain the, uh, the flaws in, in you know, Einstein's theories. So it's an ongoing story. And, and that's, that's what's wonderful about it. You know, you can't ever say we figured it all out. You know, like you can never really say that, you know, all all the great songs have been written it's it's not that way it's 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 a constant evolution and and long may it continue yeah you know, there's one i know you want to finish though. i'm really sorry but i just wanted, I really wanted to ask edge something it, it yeah, came from what he was saying which is about the songwriting and i've heard it said there's a thing in mathematics called a platonic kind of school of mathematics which right. is you discover it so it's all yeah. there do you think music's like that because i hear a lot of musicians say and you almost said it that the song kind of comes and, yeah. and I've heard some musicians say, "We, I catch you. I just get it. It's coming through my room, and I go, ah, got well, here Well, here's my theory on it, is that a really great piece of music is sophisticated on so many levels, and it's way, way too complicated to just be figured out in a sort of incremental way. It's like you can't do it that way. You've almost got to hear it. You've almost got to understand it as a complete entity in an instant. And I think that's, that does happen with bands and does happen with me occasionally with music that I'm composing. And what I would say is that the conscious mind, that part of the brain that we use to navigate our normal day-to-day -day activities is not the most creative part of our brains. I think we have a creativity which we can occasionally tap into, which is way more powerful and can sometimes give us these gifts, whether it's a complete song or an idea like relativity, or I'm sure when you're working on your TV shows or working on your books, you will get these gifts where suddenly the perfect phrase arrives, the perfect explanation, the perfect idea, and you, you don't really know where it came from. And I think that's it's one of the great mysteries of, of humanity is that creativity and where it resides, the mind, the human mind, the creative mind, it's, it's much more complex and mysterious. And, and that, by the way, could be a segue into the, the next installment because we talked the other day about how human beings might actually use quantum computing in some strange way. But we'll save that for, for the next yeah. chat. That, now we the have... Mind, the most beautiful thing in the universe. We, that's, that's where... That's where we've got to, I think. Yes. The most beautiful thing we know of. So we will conclude there, the human mind, the most beautiful thing in the universe. We also have set up, clearly, the live Dorky Book Festival 2022, where we can all meet here together. Brian Definitely. and Edge, we will see you next year. And thank you both. An extraordinary conversation. Thank you both very much indeed. Thanks a million. Thank you. Thanks, David. Thanks, Thanks. Brian. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Cheers, Bye. guys. Bye. Bye. Just a quick note to say thank you to all our Patreon supporters. And if you fancy supporting us on Patreon, you can check us out at patreon.com forward slash David McWilliams.